Listeners, beware. This podcast contains themes of the macabre and does not shy away from the details. Our content is graphic and our language is colorful. We might not be your cup of tea, so listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome to episode 14 of The Killer Tea. On today's episode, we will be talking about Juana Barraza, the old lady killer. We are your hosts, Chelsea and Christina. And for the next hour, we will be the bringers of the bullshit. The purveyors, purveyors, propellers, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> we will be the purveyors of the fucked up bullshit. Yes. So... On today's episode, we are actually going to a different country again. Yes, we are. We're We're going going to to Mexico. Mexico. And this is our female killer. Yeah. Who actually didn't murder members of her family. Yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, we've only covered one female killer who has killed members of her family. So I think it should be added in there. The reason why I say that is because most lady killers kill Members of their family. Yes. Yes. So it's very different when they don't. Yes. She has Lady Doss vibes. Not Lady Doss vibes. Nanny Doss vibes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were killing for the same reasons. Yeah. Essentially. Who else am I thinking of as well? I'm thinking of somebody else. I don't know who you're thinking of. I don't know either. Would you like to set the scene or you want me to set the scene? Um, you can set the scene. <laughs> Juana Barraza was born on December 27, 1957, near Hidalgo, Mexico, which is a rural area near Mexico City. And her parents are Drusta Samperio and Trinidad Barraza. We're going to try to not butcher these but we're going to butcher them we're gonna try really hard to be good we might just stay on like a first name basis for them because listen we just aren't great with (laughs) what is it yeah we're just not good at pronouncing shit that we don't know how to already say we're not and we've looked up how to pronounce this and we just our mouths don't work the way they need to work <laughs> to pronounce these names. That's what she says. So I'm really sorry. And I hope this isn't offensive that we can't pronounce all of these, but we're, we're, trying. we're, we're trying. So Trinidad, her father, mm-hmm. is an interesting man, to say the least. He considered himself to be a ladies man, and he bragged that he fathered up to, what was it, 31 children? Yeah, he claimed to have fathered up to 31 children, and Trinidad... Wasn't present for any of them. No, Trinidad and Jessa were never married. Like, they were never married. Her mother, Juana's mother, was an alcoholic prostitute. She was 13, too. Yeah, and Trinidad was... I've I've read like mixed things on him. Some said that he was a judicial police officer and others said that he was a farmer. So do what Who you knows? will with that. But yeah, her mom was only 13 when she met Trinidad and they met at a nightclub. She ended up getting knocked up yes. from this interaction. Yep. They actually had two daughters yeah, together. Yeah, they had two go- daughters together. And I mean, this is 1957 like it's still fucking weird. It's fucking weird. She's 13 years old, dude. And I don't know how old he is, but I'm pretty sure that he was an adultier adult at the time. He was not 13. Yeah. He was a police officer. He was yeah. old enough to know He better. was an adultier adult, which makes that so gross mm. and not okay. But anyways, at age five, Jessa abandoned Trinidad and began an adulterous relationship with Refugio Sampirio. Did I say that right? I think so. <laughs> 
who was a married man. So, you know, Jessa, she's out here just being awesome. Oh, not only was he a married man, Jessa's mother was married oh, yeah, to him. Right. He was her stepfather. It was her stepdad. So much. Oh, my God. That is, I forgot how fucking gross that was. Yeah. So Juan is five and they leave her father and her sister and go to stay with Justa's mother, Juana's grandmother, and Justa starts up a relationship with her stepfather. Yeah, she looks at her stepfather like he's a tall drink of water. So Juana's step-grandfather has now become her father figure. As much as this is uncomfortable to say, he probably is the most... Oh, he is the most reliable person that's in, her, in life. her life. Her mom was undoubtedly a piece of garbage, but she didn't have the best start in life. So what can you do? Oh, dude, I have no sympathy for her mother. Yeah, her, her mom, mother is a garbage she individual. She is a dumpster panda. Juana is never taught how to read or write she is completely illiterate she is physically abused by her mother and is not exposed to much outside of her own home situation she has a really really toxic relationship with her mother and it gets so bad the abuse that at the age of 12 juana's mother actually pimped her out to a man named jose lujo in return for three beers. Yeah, the, well, to go back, going back to the statement about her not learning to read or write, she didn't have enough time to Mm-mm. because her mom made her raise her siblings and mm-hmm. clean their house and yep. do all the chores and all the things that were none of her business that she, that was supposed to be the responsibility of her mother. Yeah. Befell to her. Her mother is a raging alcoholic. Yeah. She's just, ugh, just... Mm. So, yeah, she's 12 years old, and she sold to this older man for three beers. So, obviously, Mother of the Year Award. She is not consenting to this. This is completely against her will. And, unfortunately, Lugo keeps her for four years, sometimes shackles her to the bed. Oh, he would tie her to the bed so she couldn't escape. And he ends up impregnating her twice once when she was 13 but she loses that pregnancy and then again when she is 16 and that pregnancy ended up in her son jose enrique lujo barraza unfortunately what is very common with people who are in abusive relationships is they're trapped they while they're being abused and and none of that is healthy or safe or anything it's hard for them especially when there's no support system Mm -hmm. for them to get out of it because I mean where are they going to go to them they might be being abused but it's better than being starving and, and homeless so frequently people who go through this kind of physical mental and emotional abuse do stay around abusers take away your autonomy and take Mm -hmm. away your feeling that you are strong and that you can live without them you don't have any of that anymore you have no self-esteem so unfortunately she does end up staying with lugo for several years in 1980 juana's mother dies from cirrhosis of the liver aka alcoholism yeah And then not too long after that, her stepfather, who is the only ounce of stability that she has in her life, also dies. Yeah. Juana finally gets the courage together and leaves Lujo with her little boy, Jose Enrique, and moves to Mexico City. Because she's illiterate, she can't get a good sustainable job. No. So she has to clean houses. Selling odd items, working for other vendors. Manual labor. Basically, all of her jobs are going to be manual labor jobs. Yeah, they are. She ends up remarrying Miguel Angel Garcia, who is an alcoholic and would often beat her. So the cycle of of abuse is continuing here which we also often see in people who are abused they generally tend to get into relationships where they are further abused so she has another daughter uh her name is erica and her and miguel actually end up staying together for four years Mm -hmm. yeah she stays with him for a good while they have another daughter so she has two children now but eventually she 
I don't know, sees the light and decides to move on. And in 1984, she marries Felix Suarez Ramirez. And she has two more children with him, Emma, Emma, Yvonne, and Jose Marvin. Some people say that he's a driver, and then other people say that he was actually a hitman and the driver was a cover. Yeah. Either way, he was involved in organized crime. Yeah, because I think um, one of the researchers pulled up his cause of death and it had something to do with organized crime. It did. So the jury's out as to what his actual role was in the mob community or Mm -hmm. the drug community, but it was something super sketch. But I honestly could not find any information on whether Felix was abusive towards her or not. The only information I could really find on him was that he really didn't pull in enough money to support her and all four of their, all four of their children. Something to add in here, this was actually kind of challenging to get really great information on because this, all of the documentaries and everything were in Spanish. And while Chelsea and I have many bilingual friends, we unfortunately are not bilingual, bilingual and had no fucking clue what those documentaries were saying. No. But we did the best we could with the information that we had, so here we go. (laughs) So in order to make money, she begins working at the vendor, like selling snacks, at a Luce Libre competition, which if you don't know what that is, it's Mexican wrestling. Yes, it's semi-pro wrestling, and this is actually part of a subculture that to be a luchador or a luchadora or lucha luchadore yeah that is considered incredibly like respectable and honorable and Mm -hmm. and it's a very um admired thing is the second biggest sport in mexico next to soccer so it's like soccer wrestling so a little a little tidbit about your girl christina um i grew up loving pro wrestling (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Val Venus was like one of my favorite wrestlers of all time, which is so gross to admit to. And of course, Stone Cold Steve Austin and The oh Rock and Triple H um, <laughs> and Mankind and all of them. But but what I was getting to with that little segue is that even those pro wrestlers in the WWE and the WCW and the WWF talk really, really fondly about Lucha Libre. It's... I mean, they're very similar, let's be honest Well, one of the ways to show that you had big cojones was to go and participate in the Lucha Libre stuff because they, there's basically like... They're more hardcore. Yeah, there's almost no limit to the violence. No. So in Lucha Libre, they have good characters and bad characters, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the Spanish names for them. (laughs) I know the bad character is called a Ruda, I think is how it was pronounced. Mm -hmm. Um, She was a, um, that's like a bad character, it's called a Ruda, but they would dress up in costume and they would use characters and it was really hardcore. So it was scripted, Mm -hmm. much like WWE and WWF and all that. They knew, you know, what the outcomes were going to be. But they were still brutal AF. But they were hardcore. Yes, and and it was very bloody and many, many brain injuries. Yes, it was good money. Wanna would go and sell all of these snacks and stuff and she'd make a good amount of money. Mm -hmm. And then one day, a talent scout for the Lucha Libre spots her and thinks she would make a great addition to to the show. Yes, and he he approaches her and she's like, sign me up. And I think he offered her like, what, 500 pesos a month or something? Well, it was said that she could make anywhere between 200 and 800 pesos a match. A match, okay. So this is really good money for her. More more money she's she's ever made. Been, you know, she's been barely making it. And this really gives her way better wages. So she eventually becomes La Dama del Silencio, which translates to the silent lady. She wore a pink and gold outfit, knee high gold boots, and a butterfly mask with a belt buckle that also had a matching butterfly on it. She, okay, she's a Ruda. She's a bad character. I know. And 
Um, when I post the photos to go with this on Instagram, I will 100% post a photo of her and her outfit mm -hmm. because I mean, it's very girly, like pink and gold, like leotard with these sparkly knee high boots. And it's very comical that she was a bad character. Uh, it is. She it is worth saying that she is a larger woman, not like heavy set woman. Like no, she's, she's just like, a she's big tall. bitch. Like, yeah, she's, she's tall and she's stocky. Like she's a big girl. So she actually really loves being a wrestler. She really does. Um, you know, the wages are better than she's ever been earning. And this probably gave her some sort of feeling of control over her life. Like she suffered all of this abuse and all of this hardship and now she essentially gets to go and beat the shit out of somebody else. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sure... This she has probably taken out some hella frustrations. Oh, yeah. And sports that are like this, not violent sports. I mean, I don't want to say it's a violent sport, but it, it, it is. That can be a it's really aggressive. big, I don't know, kind of like... What's the word I'm looking for here? So in all, in all kinds of really competitive, aggressive sports, and you see this with teenagers, with mm -hmm. grownups or whatever. It can be an outlet. It That's can be an outlet. For. And sometimes that much high aggressive energy can translate into your everyday life where you're quicker to anger mm -hmm. um, and, and things like that. So you did see a little bit more of that coming out. And Juana. Yeah. Um, the matches, unfortunately, really start to take a physical toll on her body. Of course they do. It's a very and, physically demanding job. Yeah, there's a lot of head injuries. She's having a lot of issues with her back. It's really taking a toll on her body. And she would often visit the witch's market Ooh. where she would get potions to help her with her pain and she would get good, good luck, luck charms. charms and one of the good luck charms was a stick of cinnamon in like a little mesh baggie mm -hmm. that she would carry around with her and i guess she felt like that really helped her eh, like i can understand the thing about good luck charms it's well there's research done yeah that, I, I listened to a podcast that talked about that. Yeah. There's, I, I should have written down what the actual research study was, but there was a research study done where they divided the groups in half and one group was given good luck charms and one group wasn't. And the group that received the good luck charms actually performed better and Basically, the research behind it is that when you're given a good luck charm, it makes you more confident and more persuasive or more, um, uh, oh my God, words are, words are hard. It make, basically, <laughs> basically makes you try harder. It makes you more confident. It makes you more sure of your abilities. And so usually then, you know, those situations end up working out better for you, but it really doesn't have anything to do with the good luck charm. It's more of mind over matter. But so she was doing anything and everything imaginable that she possibly could to try and make ends meet. And while at this point she had stayed relatively crime free, Shit's going to change because this is taking a toll on her body, on her on her family, and she has children that she has to, that for one, their fathers aren't in their lives. No. And that she needs to provide for them. Well, and then to make matters worse, Felix dies mm -hmm. after 10 years of them being together. And it is suspected that he died because of his involvement with organized crime. Now, not only is her body getting beaten up on a pretty regular basis with these wrestling matches, her other source of income dies and leaves her with, at this point, her oldest two children are older and out of the house. But she still has two young children that she needs to take care of. So she's having a hard time kind of figuring out what she's going to do. And this is kind of where the criminal activity starts to well start it's small things at first yep she'd be in stealing from stores you know pickpocketing um robbing cars and using a toy gun yeah she would rob places with it nothing that hurt anybody else no at mm. first at first but then rumor has it her two children or one of her children is robbed 
robbed at gunpoint by a person dressed in a nurse's outfit. Yeah, and I think this may have sparked some ideas for her. It either inspired her like, oh, that's a really good idea, or it triggered her. Yeah, I'm not from- really sure which one we're we're going with here. because nurses are thought of to be protectors and maternal and i don't know and since her mom wasn't either one of those things who knows interesting it's but interesting. either way she ends up starting up kind of a partnership with a friend and i'm gonna butcher the crap out of this chick's name but it's rsli tapia martinez and these two start dressing up as nurses and acting as caregivers and begin robbing older women. So she gets really, really good at this. They're both good at it. Yes. But how suspicious is it that her friend is, like, good with dressing up as a nurse? I almost wonder if that is who robbed her kids. Oh. Well, I thought she brought her friend in on it, was my understanding. Yeah, it's just, like, interesting that that's what they would go with. Oh, well, I thought the person was a man dressed as a nurse that robbed them, not oh, a woman dressed as a nurse that It could that have been. Them. I just assumed it was a woman. Um, but the reason why this whole nurse thing works out really, really well is Mexico had began a program that was kind of like social security Mm -hmm. and healthcare. Part of one of the benefits is that the senior citizens now have access to these government facilities that will help them with healthcare and doctor's visits. They are eager, the, the older women are eager to learn about them in order to take advantage of the program and to get the help that they need. Well, eventually Juana cuts her friend out of this whole scheme they have going on because, you know, she doesn't want to share whatever they've got going on. While R.S. Lee was dating a corrupt federal officer who would basically threaten to arrest Juana. She didn't want to get into any trouble and he was a corrupt officer and would basically blackmail her into giving them money. And so she's really kind of struggling. Yeah, she pays them money to keep herself out of jail. That's, That's what that is. Yeah. So shortly after this, her oldest son, Jose, is killed. And it's suspected that he's killed due to gang violence. Whether or not he was caught in the cross fire or or directly involved it's it's unknown i found conflicting information on that Mm -hmm. but her oldest son is killed and this is kind of like the straw that breaks the camel's back for her bear in mind lifelong trauma all throughout her life people are dying left and right that she loves and cares about she was raped and and not good things so Shit's going down. Yeah, she begins specifically searching out older, weaker women to rob. And the way she would do this is she would pose as a social worker to gain trust from her victims and would be coming to their homes claiming that she's there to help them sign up for this government assistance. So November 25th, 2002, it's scary how, I mean, I guess this is 18 years ago, but it seems so it recent. It seems so recent. So I recent. Know. I mean, this was a few years before my first child was born. My only child was born. But November 25th, 2002 was the first known victim. It was 60-year-old Maria de la, Cru- de la Luz. Butchered it. <laughs> she is suspected to begin murdering in 1998, Mm -hmm. but this is the first one that they can 100% pin on her. So they're not 100% sure what happened here. If this old lady had pissed her off, antagonized her, insulted her, what? Regardless, she triggered. Yeah. She loses her shit. Definitely triggered. And Juana lashed out and basically beat Maria and then strangled her to death. So this makes Juana not a organized killer, but a disorganized Disorganized. killer. And this is a crime of passion. Yeah, for lack of a better word. Marie is later discovered by her son. 
and the police are called and they actually find prints at the crime scene. But Juana had never been arrested and so her fingerprints weren't in the database. So, you know, nothing came up. But initially, police didn't think anything of it. They didn't really have any information to go off of and basically just assumed it was kind of like a robbery gone wrong. Also, not to mention at the time, there are a bunch of criminals committing this exact same kind of crime. Yeah, robbing defenseless late old ladies is not an uncommon practice in Mexico City at this point. Usually it's done by men. Yes. However, there's exceptions to every rule. There really are. And something to be said about the police force, they're not really doing forensic science. It's There's not funds no, for it. They're, no, no. So doing DNA testing and all of that, that shit, even in 2002, it's not quite up there yet. Well, and they're not even working like our FBI is in the States. Mm -hmm. They don't have profiles for killers. They don't have a profiling program. They don't have ways of tracking serial killers or anything like that. So they're not even thinking of it being a serial killer at this point, even though serial killers have that the term has been around mm -hmm. for god at this point what 30 something years the terminology yeah. and the science we're talking about mexico and mexico city and not the united states not to you know shit on they don't mexico. exactly they have, the don't have the funding that we have, have the resources yeah now we have something that develops into her modus operandi yes and it's death after death after death and it's all women in their late 70s, mid 80s, being strangled, robbed, and, and beaten. But also, oddly enough, sometimes she keeps little things that don't have any monetary monetary value. Yeah, she starts keeping like like mementos, mementos or totems and tokens. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six. There's seven. Eight mur yeah, there's eight murders that happen in 2003 that can't necessarily 100% be tied to her, mm -hmm. but are suspected of being tied to her. And November 5th, 2003, police had enough evidence and witness testimonies to believe that a serial killer was involved and that it was a tall person with rough factions who was posing as a city council nurse or social worker to gain the victim's trust. So within a year, they're figuring out that, okay, it's some person posing as a social worker. That's how they're doing it. Well, they think it's some dude. Yeah. Not just some person. No. They think it's a guy dressed as a, a, a woman. And here's the funny part. Witnesses are telling the police it's a woman. But the police are going, no, no, it's not. There's no way. There's no way. So that's, they're basically burying their heads in the sand here. They're looking for a man. They're, they're putting information out there to, you know, the elderly community, like, hey, <laughs> watch out for this. They're still describing a man to the elderly okay. community. This community of older women are getting these notifications and pamphlets and stuff made and sent to them. But again, they're trying to say that it's a man dressed in women's clothing. So whenever Juana shows up at their doorstep, they're not suspecting. Because in person, they can tell that it's a very clearly a blonde, uh, dyed blonde haired woman, woman who's, I mean, she's tall, but she wears makeup. She mm -hmm. looks nice. So. In 2004, there are 14 more murders that are possibly linked to Juana. And she's not committing things like fraud. She's literally robbing them. She's yeah. not like getting on life insurance policies like some of our other murderers and stuff have. Mm -hmm. She's killing them based on the convenience and opportunity right. and then robbing them. So they're dying for not a whole lot of money. No. Nope. In mid-2005, Juana begins a relationship with a taxi driver, and his name is Jose Francisco Torres Herrera, but he is known as El Frijol, which means the bean. <laughs> what? I don't know. <laughs> that is and he becomes her accomplice. And in 2005, the amount of crimes that she is committing really kicks up. 
And she actually ends up killing. Chelsea's counting them. <laughs> 60, 17 people in 2005. She actually changes this up a little bit. Um, some of these people she strangles with pantyhose. Other ones she actually stabbed. Well, I mean, she uses whatever is in the house. But more often than them. not, it's strangulation. Yeah, more often than but not. But that, that says them. a lot to begin with because most of the time when you have female serial killers, it's Poison. Yeah, it's non-violent ways that they usually kill people, but she, I mean... I mean, she was a luchadora, she, so... Yeah, so I think that could have something to do with the level of violence that she's using. But what happens is she fucks up a little bit, kind of. In 2005, a new program is launched called Operation Parque y Jardines which essentially translates to Operation Parks and Gardens. And officers start patrolling the areas where the killer or Juana, like the activity has escalated in these areas. So they really start patrolling these areas and handing out pamphlets, advising the elderly to be wary of strangers, not to answer their door, and start handing out sketches of what they believe Juana looks like, which is a man. Still on the man shit. They actually start announcing that they're looking for a homosexual man, which is hugely criticized by the public. But they're convinced that the killer must be a transvestite or transgendered. And they end up arresting 49 transvestite prostitutes who ended up all being released because their prints don't match the prints collected from the crime scene. Bear in mind. This is like what? This is 2005. 2005. So my 14-year-old daughter was born in November 2005. They're basically looking at this French serial killer, right? Who was a homosexual man, Thierry Polin, and he was called the monster of Montmartre. I, I'm sure I just butchered the shit out of that. But they look at this serial killer who had a very similar modus operandi. He would kill older ladies. I wonder if because the French decided to help with their resources, with the forensic side of things, if they were like talking about, oh, we oui, we oui, monster of Montmartre and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I am the French. <laughs> and the Mexican government was like, yeah, that sounds about right. I'm going to go with that. Um, yeah, probably. Honestly, that's probably what happened. They probably just went, oh, that's similar. It must be a homosexual I'm man. I'm super sorry to French people. Yeah, that was really terrible of it's us. It's fine. Je ne sais quoi. <laughs> so they end up arresting all of these poor men who have nothing to do with this. But now, like, they're in the database and they have, a, you know, a, not, a, no, like, not a record, but it's going to show that they've been arrested. Yeah. Which is un very unfortunate. Yeah. Well, January 25th, 2006, Ana Maria de los Reyes Alfaro is 84 and she is strangled with a stethoscope. And it's, this is finally the thing that bitch smacks her down to the ground. Ana Maria lives in a duplex, essentially. And she owns the duplex and lives on one side and has a tenant on the other side. Well, the tenant on the other side sees Barraza leaving and she goes to check on her landlady and sees that she's dead. And so her tenant freaks out, calls the police, Oh, and runs out of the house. Oh, yeah. Screaming that the landlady had been murdered. murdered. And the police catch up to her very, very quickly. They do a search of her home. Mm -hmm. And they found her her little trophy, trophy stash. Room. Newspaper clippings of the murders. Which, and she's illiterate. She can't read these newspaper clippings. Yeah. But she has them. Interesting point. Hmm. And hmm. she also has two altars, I guess, to, oh God. Jesus, Jesus Malverde and Santa Mar Muerta. Mar Muerta. 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 
Muerta. Muerta. Sorry. And those are saints commonly worshipped by Mexican criminals. Dark magic. Well, Santa Muerta is like the saint of death. Patron god of death. Yeah. Yes. So in 2008, Barraza is tried for 30 murders and was found guilty of 16 of them. Now, I have found numbers varying from she was found guilty of 11 to 16. Mm. I've it's really inconsistent, the reports that I've found. And she's also convicted of 12 robberies. So Mexican law prohibits those from serving over 50 years in prison, which is garbage. So she is sentenced to 759 years in prison. But regardless of anything, because of this Mexican law, she'll be released in 2058 at the age of 100. She's still alive in prison and the kicker bish got married in prison Ugh, she got married to another inmate who was serving a life sentence for murder a male inmate wait do they have co-ed jails they must have co-ed jails and i was listening to the female criminals podcast and they said that in mexico they actually have a thing where the prison will like pay for you to get married and we'll have food and cake for you. They do that in some American prisons. Yeah. So I don't know if the, she, the prison will pay for it, but they'll oh, allow you to have oh one. Oh, no. The prison pays for it in Mexico. That's weird. And so she got married to another inmate who was serving life sentence for murder. I mean, I would have done it just for the fa- fucking cake. I mean, how often are you going to get cake? Well, they figured out that they weren't really soulmates and they got divorced anyway. Oh, my God. She couldn't even touch his pee-pee. I mean, I mean, maybe. Well, maybe they can't have they conjugal can't. visits. I don't, I don't know. know. This took, just took a weird turn. <laughs> Sorry. So, we, I feel like that went really fucking fast. Well, it talking did. talking about her. It's only 40 minutes long. It's not even 40 minutes long right now. It's fine. We have, it's fine. We have lots it's of nice. other stuff to talk about. So, there's some speculation on what snapped for Juana. Now, we talked about all her childhood trauma. Right. Yes. She was abused sexually, physically, all of that. She then had a lot of other life trauma with her, you know, her son being killed, her husband's dying, all her of, stepfather dying. All of that stuff happened during very formative years. I mean, all of this stuff transpires before she's even fucking 30. Oh, yeah. It's pretty rough. But what's interesting is she was a wrestler. Mm -hmm. Right. And the Luce Libre fights are known for being very vicious and very hard on her body. There is this trauma syndrome that comes to people who have significant head trauma over and over again. And it is called CTE, which is, is short for chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And... For those of you who do follow wrestling. Hi. <laughs> well, I'm back in the day. Yeah. On June 25th of 2007, WWE wrestler Chris Benoit killed his wife and son before killing himself. And during his autopsy, they looked at his brain and found out that he actually suffered from CTE. So... Let's talk about CTE because I think it's very important here. To, to talk about him just a little bit. So he was well-loved in the wrestling oh, community. yeah. Very popular. Um, his marriages did have troubles, but they weren't like... I mean, as far as I know, as a fan, like, like nobody thought of him as being violent or aggressive. And I don't remember any of his... He wasn't known for being violent or aggressive outside of the ring. Yeah, it truly... From what I remember, it shook that community. I mean, I I was coming out of it at that time that it happened. Like, I wasn't watching WWF Mm -hmm. as much anymore. Um, But, I mean, he had a very long, very lucrative lucrative career in the wrestling industry. Mm -hmm. He was well-beloved. So it was crazy when it happened. Yeah. The research that I was doing on Chris Benoit basically said that everyone was shocked. The 
day that he committed the murders of his wife and son and the suicide, he was actually supposed to be going to some big media event mm -hmm. or some big meeting and kept saying that he was going to be late and then eventually just stopped responding mm -hmm. to like his friends and his manager. And then they found out that he had um, killed his wife. I think, I believe he strangled her, suffocated his son and then killed himself. Fucked up shit, man. So to talk about CTE, it is a degenerative brain disease that's found in athletes. So think um, football players, pro wrestlers, military veterans, um, anyone that has a history of repetitive brain trauma. So it can be caused by blows to the head, by explosives, anything that will kind of shake your brain around. Here's the kicker. It can only be diagnosed post-mortem. There's no MRI, there's no CT scan that can detect it. It can only be diagnosed by slicing the brain hmm. and looking at the pieces. At and best, people would probably guess that you had a TBI. Yeah. It's caused by a protein called tau form, tau, and it forms clumps that spread throughout the brain and kills brain cells. So the symptoms of CTE are usually difficulty thinking, impulsive behavior, depression or apathy, short-term memory loss, difficulty planning and carrying out tasks, emotional instability, substance misuse, or suicidal thoughts and behavior. So I have a interesting question for you. Yes. Knowing what you know now about the effects of things like TBI and CTE, mm -hmm. do you think we should allow sports like football and like wrestling that are extreme contact. Like at all? Like to the degree that they exist now. <sighs> this is a controversial conversation. It's a very controversial topic. No, I don't. I think that when you know better, you should do better. Mm -hmm. That's just my personal opinion. Do I think we should get rid of the sports altogether? No. Do I think that we need to come up with better testing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do I think we need to take concussions and head trauma more seriously? Fuck yeah. Well, they're fine. The research that they're doing on the CTEs and the TBIs is they're finding stuff that's even kids playing peewee football. Oh, yeah. Now, when it comes to kids playing sports, mm -hmm. I think that needs to be overhauled we had I, two two high school kids from my school drop dead from brain injuries um one of the kids that i didn't go to high school with him but i went to high school with his brother mm -hmm. and he had a scholarship to osu was you know big on the football team and he had a horrible horrible accident where he was hit on the field and got paralyzed from the chest down so I bring this up because this could maybe not have been what pushed her over the edge. We, we won't know until she's dead. Yeah, we, we have no clue. However, wild speculation, wild speculation, if things like that do create these scenarios where the person's brain physically, chemically changes, and you become a more aggressive person that is likely to commit suicide or, I don't know. We have the research on what happens to a brain after concussions, after mm -hmm. repeated concussions, after TBIs and all of that stuff. Should we allow those kind of contact sports? I don't think we should because if you don't die from it, you, you're more pro wrestlers and football players live their average life is to their mid fifties, mm -hmm. what and they usually die from something related to a brain injury. But I mean, we also have to look at it's not just pro athletes; it's military personnel. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all it takes is an explosive going off too close to them for it to cause brain damage. And I don't know. I think if something, if something could become the switch that gets flipped. Is playing a sport really worth it? And it's not just the playing of the sport. We also have to talk about the care that goes into oh, this. 
Yeah. The care for military personnel is horrible. The VA is underfunded and understaffed and not run right. Oftentimes, brain injuries with veterans are not taken seriously. Well, if we stay with the um, luchadoras and wrestling, Mm -hmm. so you, you go back to Chris, the WWF, what a lot of people don't know is the WCW, the WWF, Vince McMahon, all of them, it doesn't pay for their medicals. So when they're having all these repeated fights and stuff where they're getting injuries, they're not getting the proper care that they need and they're going right back there because they need that paycheck. Mm -hmm. They're almost, and this is very controversial, they're almost like indentured servants to the WWF. So I can only imagine what it's like to the luchadors and luchadoras back in Mexico. Yeah. There's probably no medical care. If If I had to wager an unsubstantiated guess... Yeah. There probably isn't. No, probably Or not. they have to pay for most of it themselves. Mm-hmm. So even if, and plus, if you're out of commission because of an injury, you don't get paid. So right. they want to get back into the ring regardless of what their injury is as soon as possible so they can make the money. Yeah. It's really sad because it really puts them into a bad spot. And then you look at, you know, professional athletes in football, they are used to this certain lifestyle. And in order to keep that lifestyle going, they need to be able to play. So how often are they brushing off a concussion as, you Not know, to mention, they love it. Mm-hmm. It's hard whenever you grow up in a culture that loves these kind of sports that and glorifies and it's being so an athlete. part of like our identity as a nation and but like for if i think of mexico i think of luchadors mm-hmm. so i get it i get it too it's just it's really sad the toll that the sports and the contact and the head injuries is having on these people yeah, yeah i agree so anyways my darling in conclusion, what do you give her on the Jeffrey scale? I'm going to give her a five or a six. Yeah. I'm, I was going to give her a five, but then I was thinking about the fact that she did manual strangulation, and I decided that six is a solid number. It takes a lot to actually strangle someone to death. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a long process. It's, it's not, not short. Not it's not short. fast. It takes several minutes, like five to ten minutes, to actually kill someone. People's via arms. This is gross, but people's arms literally go tired from doing it. Like they. That's why there's such a battle that goes back and forth, is because it is physically exhausting to have to do to someone. Yes, yeah, so it's pretty rough that she actually strangled people to death. There's a lot of really great information on her. Unfortunately, it's just all in Spanish. In Spanish. And I guess we could have asked our friend Mel to come and hang out with us and like explain everything. But even the stuff that I was looking at didn't always have subtitles. Mm-hmm. So really, we just had a few podcasts and some articles online to go off of. So we did the best with the information that we had. I really wish that we could have fleshed out this whole scenario just a little bit more yeah i do too but it's okay we pulled it together um yeah and that's everything that's i'm tired i know i am too (laughs) we recorded back to back today y'all so it was a long night and we had to do a few we did our live q and a it was just a busy ass night yes it was so should we do our palate cleanser um yeah let's do a palate cleanser I'm looking up some Mexican wrestling memes. Random. Oh my God! There's gotta be Nacho Libre. Oh man. Oh my God. Oh, we should just do Nacho Libre quotes. Oh my God, that would be funny. Oh my God, these are cracking me up. But it's really like a, you know. Oh, it says, fighting for a belt, wears no pants. <laughs> Luce Libre, it's pro wrestling, but fabulous. <laughs> I am the gatekeeper of my own destiny, and I will have my glory in the hot sun. <laughs> oh, God. 
underneath the robe you will find a man. <laughs> I'm not going to do it in the accent because that's disrespectful. Oh my god. Nacho Libre. Pro wrestling. Make sure to wear elbow pads. Remember, safety first. <laughs> oh, Lord oh, Jesus. Lord Jesus, hallelujah. Well, thanks for joining us today. We love y'all. And if you would like to leave us some commentary, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The Killer T. You can also shoot us an email at thekillert at gmail.com or leave us a voice message. And don't forget to rate and review our podcast on Apple Podcasts, if that's where you listen, and show us some love. Yeah, we appreciate it. All right, y'all. Until next time. Bye. Bye. Join us next week where we discuss Keith Hunter Jesperson, the happy face killer. killer.